Hello, my name is Robert Tuttle. I'm retired now, but in the early 1980s, I was a U.S. Navy pilot with the call sign King Tut. I was also a polar aircraft commander that flew ski-equipped LC-130 cargo planes down in Antarctica. I served in Antarctic Development Squadron 6, which is also known as VXE-6. The squadron's unofficial nickname was the Puckered Penguins. I hope you will enjoy learning a little bit about flying on the vast continent of Antarctica that we all call the ice. The XC-6 flew two types of aircraft on the ice. The large four-engine LC-130 Hercules aircraft that I flew was equipped with both wheels and skis. This picture shows a ski herc taken off from the South Pole. We also had UH-1N Huey helicopters in the squadron that operated near our base at McMurdo Station. All the pilots in VXE-6 wore ambermatic sunglasses when we were flying because the bright sunlight reflecting off the snow made it hard to see the landing surface. VXE-6 air operations were a critical part of the Operation Deep Freeze. Our missions were flown to resupply U.S. Antarctic bases and also support science expeditions that were conducted in numerous remote areas on the ice. This video shows a ski takeoff and landing from an established skiway as well as a cargo pallet offload. Taking off and landing on the skis was a unique experience for me and was very challenging due to the rapidly changing snow conditions, especially at the remote science camps. The XE-6 twin-engine Huey helicopters operated out of a hangar in McMurdo. They had much shorter range than the LC-130s, but were able to deliver scientists and cargo in many important areas, including the dry valleys. McMurdo Station was the largest U.S. base on the ice and was located near the Ross Ice Shelf and also near an active volcano named Mount Erebus. Every winter, the ice would freeze around McMurdo and cut off access to the base. A U.S. Coast Guard icebreaker would have to come down at the beginning of each summer season and break open a channel for the cargo ship to deliver fuel, food, and supplies to allow the station to exist for another year. The weather at McMurdo was very unpredictable. The air was always very dry, so you needed to drink a lot of water to prevent dehydration. When the wind blew hard, the snow would reduce visibility to zero in McMurdo. When these storms occurred, you would just stay in your building. The weather down at the ice runway and the skiway was also unpredictable. When the winds blew the dry snow around, it was very difficult to do maintenance on the planes. The hard-working VXE-6 maintenance personnel had to do the servicing and repairs without any shelter because we did not have any LC-130 hangars on the ice. If the weather got really bad, maintenance would be suspended and the missions would be delayed. Christchurch, New Zealand had a VXE-6 maintenance detachment that did major repairs and inspections on the LC-130s that could not be done on the ice. In August each year, several LC-130s flew very long round-trip missions from Christchurch, New Zealand to McMurdo Station and then back to Christchurch. These missions were called windfly flights, and the engines would never be shut down after we landed on the Williams Field Skiway. We would just offload the cargo and passengers and hot refuel so we could get back to New Zealand as quickly as possible. In September, we would go back down to the ice from Christchurch with most of the squadron personnel, and then begin the resupply missions to all parts of the continent while living in McMurdo. We would not head home to California until February each year, so these were long deployments away from our families, and letters took a long time to get home. We flew a lot of resupply missions with cargo, fuel, and passengers from McMurdo to the South Pole during my three seasons on the ice. We also flew a lot of aviation fuel in the Bird Station, which was basically a refueling station for us later in the summer season. The continent covers an area that is larger than the entire area of the continental United States. 
The scenery as you fly around the continent was breathtaking, including massive glaciers, mountain ranges, and vast areas of ice and snow. I considered myself very fortunate to have been able to see the continent from the air. The South Pole is very cold, very dry, very windy, and at a very high altitude over 9,300 feet above sea level. VX-6 and VX-E-6 flew many resupply missions to the South Pole during the 44 years the squadron operated on the ice. In addition, history was made twice. Admiral Byrd's crew did the first flyover of the South Pole in 1929, and VX-6 pilot Gus Shin made the first landing at the South Pole in 1956. Just about everyone that goes to Antarctica and gets the opportunity to go to the South Pole has to have their picture taken to prove that they were there. This is a picture of me walking through the dry snow with the ceremonial South Pole and standing on Observation Hill overlooking the Ross Ice Shelf and Skiway. In 2012, I was notified that a cape near McMurdo had been named after me called Tuttle Point. So that is even better proof than I was there than the pictures. The Lockheed LC-130 Ski Hercules was a very reliable airplane to fly. However, flying in Antarctica and taking off and landing on snow and ice covered surfaces was hard on the LC-130s and sometimes things would break. The nose ski in particular took a lot of beatings and sometimes it would malfunction as in this video. Remote science camp missions were always the most challenging missions we flew because you were landing in places no one had ever been before and you were landing a very large, very heavy airplane on unknown snow conditions. We had many techniques to minimize the risk such as surveillance missions to the area and a ski drag technique to test the snow before we landed. However, sometimes things would go terribly wrong. There were many accidents over the years due to weather, hidden crevasse fields, and loss of situational awareness due to the visual perception problems with landing in white landing areas and snow-covered terrain. The exploration of Antarctica has yielded many scientific discoveries, but as in any exploration effort, it has had a high cost on aircraft, but more importantly on the people, including the loss of members of VXC-6. VXE-6 delivered massive amounts of fuel, cargo, and many thousands of passengers over the 44 years of the squadron's existence. The puckered penguins, later renamed the Ice Pirates, had a very long history of success on the ice. However, in 1999, the Antarctic resupply mission was transferred to the Air National Guard out of New York. They had flown LC-130s for years on the snow-covered areas of Greenland. I wish them the best and hope they stay safe as they continue the Operation Deep Freeze mission. This presentation is dedicated to my squadron mates in VX-6 and VX-E-6 and all the brave men and women who have worked on the ice over the last century from the United States and also from many other countries. A special thank you to the wonderful people in New Zealand. They graciously hosted our VXE-6 maintenance department at Christchurch's airport and also made us feel at home as we passed through their beautiful country on the way to the ice. To learn more about VXE-6, the history of naval aviation or Antarctic flying, please visit the websites listed on the slide. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>